time references that we'll have. Remember, as we're studying the Bible, while we're studying the Bible, what we are looking at is history. The Bible is history from the, the creation to the consummation. It's a historical account of what God has done, is doing now, and will continue to do. This blessing will happen through what we call the death, and this is important, the death of the testator, or Jesus is the testator. And let me read for you Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 to 17. I want you to notice verse 17. It's a very important verse. For this reason, he, that is Yeshua, is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that is the Mosaic covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of internal inheritance. For where there is a testament, and by the way, you see that word over and over again, testament, covenant, you see it in verse 4 a couple times, here in verse 15, 16, 18, and 20, same word, D-F-A-K, right? For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that is the Mosaic covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Now watch verse 17. Notice the application. For a testament is in force, is in force, bebeasos. It's through the idea of basality, right? This covenant is in force after men are dead since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Now, that's important because it's a time reference passage. What it's telling you is when Jesus was alive, could you be under the new covenant at that time? No, because he's still alive. Are you with me so far? Are you seeing that? So ask yourself these questions as we're studying. You can see that reference several times. And so what we want to look at now is the Mosaic Covenant. We looked into it before. We saw how in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, God said that, not, that his spirit would not always strive with men and keeping them under control, but he had... Uh, he had bore with them for 120 years as Moses was building the ark. We saw in uh, Psalm 51, 11, how David talked about the spirit would leave him, or he prayed to God that the spirit would not leave him. We saw in 1 Samuel chapter 10, God gave the Holy Spirit to Samuel. But we look over in chapter 16, and let me just read that for you before we go on. Chapter 16 and verse 14, and I, I want to try to move along here for time's sake so that we can get to some of the more important things, but, well, these are all important, but chapter 16, verse 14, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a distressing spirit from who? From the Lord troubled him. So God removed God, the Holy Spirit from him and sent a distressing spirit upon Saul. And of course, you know, the idea then is that Saul then began to persecute David, throwing a spear at him and things of that sort, right? And so you remember in our outline, we were talking about the promises. We looked at them, the cutting of those covenants. Sorry about that. And the oaths in which he swore. And now we are on that unilateral or unconditional covenant kept by Yahweh. It's implied, and that first one that's implied is that covenant covenant. Of redemption. Now, this is the outline that I wanted to give you that we might be able to go over, I'm hoping, and, and I hope that this will help you some, uh, and, and then we'll see. And this will be on your outline next week. I didn't have time to give it to you this week. You remember that we looked at several passages, and again, this is in reference to the work of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> we looked at several references where it was impossible for some people to understand what Jesus was saying. You remember that? If I give you just a couple of them, like um, Luke chapter 2, if we could turn there, if you want to just turn Luke chapter 2 and verse 50. Luke chapter 2 and verse 50, but they did not understand the statement which he, that is the Lord, spoke to them. They did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Chapter 9, 
of the Gospel of Luke. And I won't go to all of them, but I wanted to hit at least a couple to remind you where we were. Again, this has to do with the work of God, the Holy Spirit. Remember, unless God regenerates the heart, regenerates the mind, you cannot understand. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 talks about that, right? Luke chapter 9, and again in verse 45. And there, but they did not understand the saying, and it was hidden from them, so they did not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him. You see that? It was hidden from them, they could not understand it, and they were afraid to ask him about this. There are multitudes of passages like this. Luke chapter 24, Mark 9, John 10, uh, Acts 16, we read of the work of the Holy Spirit opening the heart of Lydia so that she could respond to those events. So there were times in the Bible where people, during the earthly life of Jesus, simply could not understand the uh, work of the Holy Spirit. Now, as far as what we have going up here, I wanted to try to help you, and I hope, uh, I hope that this will uh, help you. You remember, we were looking at the various covenants, and uh, we, we haven't gotten into the Abrahamic covenant, but you remember the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 15 is cut, and in that covenant, you have the land, seed, and blessing promise, and that blessing promise is the promise of the, the work of regeneration, the work of regeneration or the new birth, as we would call it, right? So under the Mosaic Covenant, when we're looking at this, when did this take place? This Mosaic Covenant, uh, it was given in Exodus, and we, uh, well, well, we'll see that in just a minute. But uh, the Mosaic Covenant, uh, the time period there is from the giving of, of it at Mount Sinai to the cross, and it was a conditional covenant. It was a bilateral covenant. Both parties had to work. Don't forget that. Remember, from the time they're given the law up until the cross, they're all under that old covenant economy. They all have stuff they must do. The moral law, the civil law, the ceremonial law. All of those things must take place up into the work of the cross. Jesus comes and he fulfills the law and the prophets. The law was given until he who the seed, until he who, to whom, uh, let me read that because I'll, I'll mess it up. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19 says, For what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgression Till the seed come to whom the promise was made, that is, Jesus is the seed there, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator, right? So you have the Mosaic Covenant given at the foot of, the, of uh, Mount Sinai, goes all the way up to the cross. It's a bilateral covenant, as we talked about. The new covenant, again, is a different covenant. Remember now, we're in a time element here. There is a time element. Now, you can skip over that if you like to, but you're going to have a lot of problems if you do. This Abrahamic covenant that's given, the land, the seed, and the blessing, the blessing flows later on, and I'm going to show you that as we go, and maybe it'll develop some questions or bring some questions to your mind. So when it would happen, and this is very important, it will happen, who knows? Can you read it up there? When will this happen? At the second coming of Christ. This new covenant, the fullness of this new covenant, fully happens at the second coming of Christ. Let me read for you the main passage here in Zechariah chapter 12, verses 10 through 14, so that you understand what we're talking about. Verse 9 says, And it will be in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, Right? You see that in verse 3. All the nations will come against Jerusalem. God will come. God will defend them. It hasn't happened. It's still yet to happen. I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me, whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, 
and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. In that day, there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of headed women in the plain of Megiddo. The land shall mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of Shimei by itself, and their wives by themselves, all the families that remain, every family by itself, and by their wives by, by themselves. So again, who is this covenant made with? Who is the, the covenant promised to? is the question that you should be asking. And so when we look at Zechariah chapter 12, Israel's physical and spiritual salvation, and if you tear apart that 12th chapter, you can see both of these happening within that 12th chapter. Okay, this is still future. It hasn't happened. Israel's physical deliverance we see in verses 1 through 9. And if you read those verses, you can see that. The nations that will attack Israel are given. God will protect Israel in verses 4 through 9. And then we see Israel's spiritual deliverance in verses 10 through 14. God's spirit, who is the cause of that revival in 10a, and then Israel's remorse, the result of revival. You see that? Now, all I, have to, all I would ask you is, have you ever seen that happen yet? That's never happened. So if it's never happened yet, is it going to happen? Well, yes, it's got to happen. So it must happen in the future. Any thoughts so far on that? Yeah, Dave. Anybody, who's mic over there? Somebody give you a mic? There we go. You can go ahead and get Dave or Brad, Will, either one. Uh, just going back a little bit to the chart about the new covenant being fulfilled at the coming of Christ. A full, and, and that, I, I, what I think I hear you say is that we are not experiencing the fullness of the new covenant at this particular time. We're not living under the full uh, development of that. Well, that's why I asked the question, to whom is the covenant made? Right, to, right? Israel, to and Israel. And that's one of the questions you will be asking. See, um, I'm trying to say it in a good way. A lot of times we've read the Bible and not been taught to study the Bible. And so we just read the Bible and we're not asking questions, especially within reference of time. You see that? And so what we have to ask is to whom are these covenants made? And, we'll, and we will, again, answer that question. Now, we have experienced the new covenant. We said that in Luke 22, and we'll, we'll look at that. Matthew, Mark uh, mentioned it. Paul mentions it again in 1 Corinthians but as far as the fullness of that covenant, are we experiencing it now? If it's in the future, then we're not experiencing it now. And we'll see that as we go. Does that answer where you were going? All right. So what is the Mosaic Covenant? You remember there the Mosaic Covenant is when Israel agrees, Israel agrees to obey God. You see that in Exodus chapter... Uh, well, several places, but in Exodus chapter 19, you see that in, I think, what is it, verse 8? Yeah, and then all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moses brought back the words uh, uh, to the peop of the people to Yahweh. Now after, you remember what happens there, they go up to the promised land, they get to the border, and then what happens? They all go in and enjoy the promised land? Remember, how many people do you think went and got up to the promised land? Just give me a guess. What do you think? Are you guys awake this morning? A couple, couple million. How many went into the promised land and enjoyed the fruits of the promised land? Somebody said four. We're told, we're told the two that went in, Caleb and Joshua, right? The rest were cut off. The rest were cut off. So when you get to the book of Deuteronomy, which is the second giving of the law, the second rehearsal to this new generation of the law, you have the same thing. 
In chapter 5, in verse 27, the Lord will scatter you among the people. You'll be left in number among the nations where he'll drive you. And is that the right verse? Where am I at? I think I wrote down the wrong verse or I'm in the wrong chapter. Yes, I'm in the wrong chapter. Sorry about that. Verse 27 of chapter 5, you go near and you'll hear all that Yahweh your God uh, may say and tell us uh, all that Yahweh our God says to you and we will hear and do it. So this second generation says the same thing. All that God has said, we'll do it. They didn't learn from the mistake of the first generation. They said everything that Yahweh said, we'll do it. So they hadn't learned at all, right? And so Israel's, the second, the new covenant, the fullness of that application, and we'll see to whom it's given, the fullness of that we see will be at the national repentance of, um, the national repentance of Israel at uh, Christ's second coming. Now, if you're going, if you're looking, and this is probably one of the biggest mistakes that people make, they don't understand that there are two comings of Christ. But if you look at uh, the book of Zechariah, and remember then in verses 8 and 9 of that 13th chapter, it'll come to pass in the land, says Yahweh, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die. But one-third shall be left in it, and I will bring the one-third through the fire. I'll refine them as silver is refined, test them as gold is tested, and they will call on my name. So only a third of the Jews alive at that time will make it through. Two-thirds will be cut off. That one-third will be brought into the land of promise in Matthew chapter 25. So when we're looking up at here, and we're talking about this new covenant, and of course we'll get into it later, but I just wanted you to realize, how many of you already know all this? couple people, you guys are fibbing, I think. I'm going to get you here in a minute. When we're looking at this and we're not asking these questions, we're not getting the context. And if you don't get the context, you're going you're gonna to get in trouble trying to interpret the Scripture. So this is why I put this up here for you to see this. The Mosaic Covenant, Israel agrees. The New Covenant in its fullness will happen at Israel's national repentance at his second coming. Right? And it's only going to be a third of them. You see that in Matthew 25, right? What was the problem? We saw this last week. All Israel are unregenerate. Now, here's where, again, you have to ask and answer these questions. The only time in the Old Testament we're, taught, we're told that all Israel is regenerate is during the land promise in Deuteronomy, again, chapter 30. And you can uh, see that when we get there. Uh, And verse 6, where God will regenerate their hearts. That's the only time that we're told there that they will be regenerate. But as we're looking at these verses here that we just saw, what we see is that Israel is not regenerate. Now, just let me give you a passage, and if you have any other comments, just feel free to jump in at any time. But uh, chapter uh, 9 of the book of Jeremiah, it's up here on the outline again. We'll post this next week. Behold, the days are coming, says, says Yahweh, I will punish all who are circumcised with the uncircumcised, Egypt, Judah, Edom, people of Ammon, Moab, and all who are in the farthest corners who dwell in the wilderness, for all these nations are uncircumcised, and all, you see that word, all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in heart. Now, I don't know how much clearer you can get than the scripture saying all of Israel is uncircumcised in heart, right? You have to do something with that. Leviticus chapter 26, again in verse 41, and there are multitudes of other passages, but I didn't have time, uh, says this, and that I have also walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If their, speaking of Israel, if their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they accept their guilt. Again, they're uncircumcised hearts. In other words, they're unregenerate heart. You see that? 
their unregenerate heart. And again, that's Leviticus 26, verse 41. You see it in Jeremiah chapter 9 and other places. Believers now are indwelt, and at the second coming will be the consummation when God comes and he regenerates that third that's left to go into the messianic kingdom. Because that messianic kingdom is still yet future. And that messianic kingdom is for a certain, specifically a certain group of people. We see the, the uh, passages there, Luke 22, verse 20, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 25, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, all talk about this new covenant which we are now experiencing. God the Holy Spirit dwells in us. If you don't have the Spirit, you're not saved, Romans 8, 9. We read about that 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6, Ephesians chapter 1 already, right? So now Gentiles are being grafted in to the covenant blessings, but we're not there yet. We're still in the old covenant, under the old Mosaic covenant, under that old system, right? So where was the power? It was external. Look, if you will, at a couple passages the Hebrews 14 and the, uh, the um, or excuse me, the Hebrews 8 and the John 14. I didn't think that sounded right. Hebrews chapter 8, and let me read that for you, and we'll go back to John. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with who? With the house of Israel. After those days, says Yahweh, I will put my law in their minds. I will write them on their hearts, and I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. In other words, he hadn't done this yet. You see that? He has not done this yet with the whole of Israel. There are Jews being saved, obviously, but then the church becomes Gentile, right? Chapter 14 of the book of John and verse 17, and I want you to just notice a couple passages there. Matter of fact, we could read uh, verses uh, 16 and 17 there. John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. Give you time if you're turning there. I can barely hear your pages turn, so I'm not sure if you're just looking at me or if you're actually following me. So I apologize if I'm going too fast. I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Again, here's notice the terms there. He'll be with you. He'll be with you forever. That's how long. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Notice that? The world cannot receive him uh, because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, and now watch this last line, for he dwells, what? With you, and he shall be in you. Do you see that? He dwells with you, he will be in you. He was with David, he was with Saul, he was with different priests, different prophets, different kings, different workers. He was with them, he enabled them, and then he left them. Remember, turn, just flip back to John chapter 7 and remember Jesus' words. Now, I, I know that you have probably many questions and everything, but again, there are so many clear passages that we have to deal with in order to sort of get our mind around this concept of the work of, of the Holy Spirit. And look at verses uh, 37 and, uh, through 39. On that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He's quoting out of Isaiah 55. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, what's he talking about? Well, we don't have to guess. We're told. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. They haven't yet. They would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. You see that? 
The Holy Spirit enabled people. He gave them insight to do things, but he did not permanently indwell them. See that? It's very important to understand. Somebody have the, where's my mic man? Is he hiding behind the curtain back here like Oz or what? That's all right. We'll use Brad. You ready, Brad? Here he goes. All right. I'll give us just a second here, and we'll see how far we get for this. Hey, I'm looking at um, Ezekiel 37. Yeah. The dry bones. And the translator, um, when this is brought to English, has chosen to put a capital S at the close, so it will say, I will put my spirit, my Holy Spirit, in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Am I to understand then that these are going to be spiritually regenerate Israel? Or are, is, are you trying to help me understand that there's a movement of the Spirit, indeed they will be brought to physical life, but they may not be born again? Well, there will be a national resurrection, which we saw in Zechariah, and then a spiritual resurrection. And that's what he's saying. That's, what, that's part of the new covenant. You see that in Ezekiel 11, Ezekiel 36. You see it in Jeremiah 31 and 32. But that's what we're talking about. There will be a national resurrection. And we'll, I'll, I'll give you the chart in just a minute here. There will be a national resurrection followed by a spiritual resurrection. Remember, we're still talking... And again, you have to keep this in mind. We're still talking about these covenants, and these covenants are on a timeline. You have the Abrahamic covenant, you have the, the gives, and included in that is uh, land seed and blessing. And so all of those happen at different parts in, uh, uh, in time. And so all we're asking and looking at here is, where are we at in time in history? Are, are we under the Mosaic Covenant? Are we under the Davidic Covenant? Are we under the New Covenant in its fullness in the beginning? Where are we at in history? See, because again, the Bible is a historical book, and it is a chronological book, right? If you, if you fail to think about that and realize that as you're reading, you're going to get into all sorts of trouble, okay? So, we're talking about where was the power? It was external. When we look at the new covenant up there, now we're, we're experiencing it. Now he's in us now. And at the second coming, the power will be, as we said, internal. Um, I think it's uh, maybe 2 Corinthians. Let me see if it, uh, chapter 3, and maybe verse, maybe verse 6. Uh, Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not as the Letter, but the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives what? Gives life. The Spirit gives life. And that's what he's talking about there. They will have spiritual birth, the rebirth, right? Regeneration in that time. And so you can look at those verses. And again, I'll put that on the chart uh, so that you can see it later on. And then let me finish this chart for you if I can. And I hope this is helping you. I don't, like I said, I don't know where you are. I don't know what you understand. I don't know what you've been exposed to. And so what I try to do is I'm trying to help you think these things through as you're studying uh, the scriptures. So as we're looking at who are the covenants made with, Israel and Judah and the seed of promise. We don't want to forget the seed of promise there. Uh, and I throw that in there because... Many people will uh, forget that, but let me just throw it up here to remind you again. When we're talking about the seed, there are four types of Abraham's seed. Remember that? Remember how we went over this? Yeah? Okay. At least nod or something. Give me a clue that you're with me. Right? You have the physical descendants, but not those who are of the faith of Abraham. They're physical Jews. Um, Ishmael and his descendants and others who are not of the faith of Abraham. We have the physical descendants who are of the faith of Abraham. Uh, and I think that this is the Israel of God. I think we'll see that later. Then you have the spiritual descendants of Abraham who are not physical descendants of Abraham. That's you and I, the Gentiles in this day and age, right? And then you have the Messiah, the ultimate seed through whom all of the blessings flow. Right? 
So remember, these covenants are made primarily with Israel. We see that over and over again. Uh, chapter, let's see, where is it? Romans 4? Or is it 9? Romans 9 and uh, verse 4, I think. Yeah, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. Israel is the one to whom the promises were, were made, right? And you can see that in other passages as well. The, uh, a good verse for you to look at, I kind of scribbled it uh, in there at the end. I know I shouldn't have, but I did anyway. So let me read that for you. Uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise, and again you have that word promise in verse 13, 14, 16, 20, all throughout there, might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. You see that? So at this part of the new covenant we're experiencing, but there is a future fulfillment which Israel will experience. You see that? And that, that uh, part they will enjoy uh, at his second coming. So it is primarily with Israel and Judah. You can see those verses there in Hebrews 8, Jeremiah 31, right? How will this change things? Remember, there will be a new heart, a new birth. There will be a new spirit. There will be a new creation, None of that is applied to anyone in the Old Testament. You won't see any of those terms applied to people in the Old Testament, right? Um, it'll, be, it'll prepare them to be God's witnesses in the Messianic kingdom or during Messiah's reign. Remember Isaiah 43, Isaiah 44, he tells them, you'll be my witnesses. Back in Zechariah chapter 8, in Zechariah chapter 8, probably a verse that maybe you've, you've not read before, uh, thus says Yahweh of hosts, people shall yet come, inhabitants of the cities. The inhabitants of cities shall go to one another, saying, Let us continue to go and pray before Yahweh and seek Yahweh of hosts. I myself will go also. Yes, many peoples and strong nations shall come and seek Yahweh of hosts in Jerusalem and pray before Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, In those days, ten men from every language of the nation shall grasp the sleeve of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. This is when Israel fulfills their covenant role. You see that? Remember, back in Romans chapter 9, forward, excuse me, in Romans chapter 9 and verse 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. They do not change. God called uh, Israel out to himself and to be a blessing to them, and that's what's going to happen for them. So when we're thinking about this, and we're thinking about Israel, if you're looking throughout the scripture, you'll see that there are actually, there are actually two gatherings of Israel. See if I can get that done there. There's the present regathering. That present regathering right now for Israel is for what? Let me see where you're at. Why are they being regathered right now? They're going home. They're going home to Israel, right? For what other reason? Are they going in the Messianic kingdom right now? Why are they going why are they all going back to Israel? Come on now. I know you guys know this, right? They're setting the stage for God's chastening. For God's chastening. That's why they're going back. You have not had the chasing of the Lord. And once we get there, you're going to see that there's just no way you can work that out in Scripture. That 70th week, that last seven years, they're going back and they're going to experience that. The, the second regathering is permanent. That's when they're going into the Messianic kingdom. That will be the one-third that we'll see when we get to that. So they return to part of the land. Back then, they'll return to the whole land. Just just so that you can get this in your mind. Because I know you have questions, and maybe you don't want to ask them. Some of you have asked questions online, and I appreciate that. And if I don't answer them, just text me the same question again, 
And maybe it'll work itself out next week. But if you look here, this is what Israel initially possessed in the very dark spot. That's all the land they possessed. You can look at the Joshua passage. You can look at the King's passage. You can look at the promise in uh, Amos as far as a future fulfillment. The land that was promised them is that multicolored promised land. That's what they were promised. And that's what it will look like when they're in that land. And you'll see that in the book of Ezekiel very clearly. And that's when the Lord's glory returns in chapter 43. You see that? If you're going to read it literally. Any thoughts so far? Questions? Right? So this first time that they're returning, they're returning in unbelief because they're going to be further chastened. When they come back after that last time, they're going to be regenerate and they'll return in faith. They'll be restored to the land only. They'll be restored to the land and to the Lord, not just the land. They're not regenerate. They're there, but look over there. They're not regenerate at all, right? The next time they return, they'll return and it'll be peaceful and they'll return to the Lord. And there's multitudes of passages that testify this. So this sets the stage for the tribulation down at the bottom. And the, the last one sets the stage for the millennial kingdom. You see that? Any thoughts or questions or comments on that? Uh, yeah, Carrie in the back. Uh, you said when they come back to Israel to set the stage for the tribulation, do you think they know that? Or are they just, it's like a, a blind inward call that they all kind of migrate? Does, has anyone ever spoke on that? Who do you mean when you say, do you think they? Who do you mean they? Well, like when we we're just talking Israel is going to return, Israelites will return to the land to set the stage for the tribulation. Do you think they know that's what's coming or are they, or are they just going back? To the land. I, I couldn't say, you know, what group knows what, but remember, unless you're regenerate and then unless the Holy Spirit is working in your heart, can you know it? You can't know it. Not unless the Holy Spirit quickens your heart and understanding to know it. And that only happens during regeneration. You see that? Good question, though. Any other thoughts? Questions or comments? And we'll get further into this. Right now, I'm just kind of giving you a, trying to whet your appetite to think through these things. Okay? Yeah, Dave? Yeah, I can't find the verse right now, but um, I believe it's in Jeremiah about the new covenant. And one of the things that it says is that there will no, no longer be a need to tell his brother which has always, uh, as, as I think about the new covenant, obviously that, that reinforces what you're saying because we are uh, right now to be telling our brothers about the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Hebrews chapter 8 is where uh, Dave is talking about here. And let me just read it for you, verses 8 through uh, 10, down through there. For if the first covenant, which was the first covenant that they were given... Come on, what was the first covenant they were given? The Mosaic Covenant. If the first covenant, remember there's two covenants, there's that bilateral and now this new, right? So he says, um, for if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. So there has to be two covenants. The first is the Mosaic, the second is the new which, again, Ezekiel talks about, Jeremiah talks about, and others talk about, when God will take out their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh, that they will obey him. You see that? That's the whole point of the new covenant. He says, I'll take out your heart of stone, I'll give you a heart of flesh, that you will obey me. Okay? Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. See, right there it is. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Right? Mosaic covenant, new covenant. 
because they did not continue in my covenant. And I discarded them, says Yahweh. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. I'll put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I'll be their God, and they'll be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know, the, know Yahweh, for all will know me from the least of them to the greatest, and I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and lawless deeds. I will what? Remember no more. This is the new covenant, and it is yet future for Israel. You see that? Any, any other thoughts, additional thoughts or questions, concerns that might come to your mind? Is any of this becoming clearer at all when we're studying Israel and God's focus for them? Right? When we look then, if you're on your, back on your outline on page 17 again, we're looking at the new covenant, and this new covenant will be a permanent covenant for the church. And let me give you just a couple passages here. Look at Luke chapter 24 and verse 49. Luke 24 and verse 49. Right? And notice Jesus' words here. Behold, I send you what? The promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are undued from power, with power from on high. Now, if they were regenerate already, why do they have to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit? Because they didn't have it. You see that? So be asking yourself these questions. Look, look at Acts chapter 1, and notice the progression here. Look at Acts chapter 1, and I want you to notice the terminology again here. Acts chapter 1, and notice there, uh, if you will, verse 4. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the what? Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. What's the promise? The promise is God the Holy Spirit. The promise is the new covenant. You see that? Look at chapter uh, 2, and I, I want you to see this. I, I hope that you'll catch this before we go. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father, now they've already received it here, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see in here. Now they have received a promise. You see that? Now it's one new man, Jew and Gentile, what we call what? The church. But we're not talking about the church. We're talking about Israel. That's who we're specifically talking about. Now, let me give you a thought to look at. Look at chapter 11. Um, Peter has been to uh, the house of Cornelius, and you know that event that went on through there. He's going to have to come before the elders, and he's going to have to talk to them. He's going to have to remind them of what happened. And I want you to uh, notice in verse 14 of that 11th chapter there, and uh, I want you to notice something in verse 15, what he says here. Uh, Who tell you words by which you and all your house will be saved. And as I began to speak, he's rehearsing what went on. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us when? At the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You see that? They were waiting on that promise. They had not had that promise because Jesus had to come. He had to live that perfect life. He had to die as the testator. And in John 7, 39, he had to rise. Now, if you say the Holy Spirit regenerated those people in the Old Testament, you have a lot of issues to deal with, right? And so I think that this is the better uh, interpretation there. Because when you look at 1 Corinthians 12, and, and we're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that baptism happens one time, and we see it in verse 13, 
For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all have been made to drink of the one spirit. You see that? All have been made to drink of the one spirit, right? So, any thoughts or questions before we get into uh, probably what I think is probably one of the more relevant uh, questions that could be asked? All right, so some would say people in the Old Testament had to be regenerate to believe, and if they were not regenerate to believe, how then could they have been saved? Right? Isn't that an issue? If you have to have the Holy Spirit to be saved, and they were not saved in the Old Testament, they were not regenerate in the Old Testament, how were they saved? Yeah, Wayne, hang on just a second. Um, I was texting back and forth with an elder about this, and he said, I don't think the Old Testament say, saints were saved at that time, though chosen to be saved. It wasn't effectual until Christ came. Then the Spirit came in power to permanently indwell the saints. The New Testament saints right now and the Old Testament saints in retrospect, they have their salvation in full. It was still faith given by God to them that saved them, but it wasn't effectual until Christ came. The Holy Spirit is a gift to the New Testament saints. Does that sound the same thing as you're saying? I'm not sure exactly what you're trying to say or ask there. He could Remember, the Holy Spirit is the promise. Right. The Holy Spirit could not be given until Christ died, until he ascends. And then he and the Father send the Holy Spirit back to baptize all into one body. That's the initial part of it. But the future part of it for Israel and Judah, to whom the promise is given, will be at his second coming. See that? Right? So you have one part of it, the baptism at Pentecost, and then you have another part of it at his second coming. When only a third of those Jews who remain, their hearts will be regenerate and they'll be regathered. See that? Or they have been regathered, they'll be uh, witnesses again to him. Right? Carrie? Carrie? I was reminded of uh, Romans 4, verse 3. Uh, they're talking about Abraham. said he, he believed God, and that was counted to him as righteousness. Yes. Any other thoughts before we, before we get ready to wind down here? Let me give you one passage to set your mind on this, and I want you to go through the Old Testament and try to look up some passages uh, that have to do with God, the Holy Spirit's work. This is 2 Chronicles, and I have dozens of passages here, but 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verses uh, 11, 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verses 11 and 12, let me read it quickly here. Nevertheless, some of Asher, Manasseh, Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Also, the hand of God was on Judah to give them singleness of heart to obey the command of the king and the leaders at the word of the Lord. And so your question there, how could they be saved? Some under the Mosaic covenant believed through the means that God had appointed to them. There were some that God enabled to do certain things. Now, he wasn't fulfilling the role that he is fulfilling now, but he was working in their hearts, and you'll see this uh, all throughout the Old Testament uh, one, one last passage, and then I'll let you go. Don't forget this. You can write this down. Many of you know this before I even read it. Proverbs chapter 21, obviously, and you know it, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of Yahweh, like the river waters. He turns it wherever he wishes. God can turn anybody's heart at any time. That's why we pray. If God could not turn anybody's heart at any time, why would you pray? Because it's all up to the person. But if you don't understand the work of the Holy Spirit, and you do think it's up to your ability and another person, you'll rely on your ability, right? 
Any other closing thoughts here? One more, real quick. Go ahead. And remember, it's not going to be, it'll be a third of how many ever Jews lived through. 